From London, we present the final episode of Dombey and Son by Charles Dickens, adapted as a serial for radio by H. Oldfield Box. Never in all his life had Captain Cuttle's knobbly, weather-beaten countenance glowed and glistened with such deep content as that evening of Walter's return to the wooden midshipman when he sat stationary at the tea board looking from Florence to Walter and from Walter to Florence. There they both were, brought together in this astonishing fashion, those two whom he had always regarded as made for each other. And so they sat till it grew late, talking of Walter's adventures and his miraculous escape from drowning, talking of poor Uncle Sol and sadly regretting his absence. But at length, when the clock struck eleven, Walter got up. Well, Mr. Ombe, I must be on my way. I must not keep you up any longer. Going, Walter? Where? He slings his hammock for the present, Lady Lass, round a Brogley's. With an ale, heart's delight. And I am the cause of his going. Dear Miss Dombey, if it is not too bold to call you so... Walter! Where would I not go? What would I not do for your sake? Dear Walter, dear brother, oh, show me the way through the world, some humble path that I may take alone and labour in. Help me, for I need help so much. Miss Dombey, Florence, I would die to help you, but your friends are powerful and rich. Your father... No, no, Walter, do not speak of him. But Miss Dombey... Listen, listen, Captain Cuttle, dear friend, and and I will tell you why I have taken refuge. And laying her head on the captain's shoulder, she told him with tears the whole wretched story. And if Captain Cuttle had not taken me in, I... Uh, there, precious. <laughs> Miss Dombey. Wash, wash me eyes. Waller, dear lad, sheer off for tonight and leave the pretty one to get to bed. Of course. Good night, Captain Cuttle. Good night, Miss Dombey. But Walter was back at the wooden midshipman next morning while the captain was still preparing the breakfast before Florence was down. Ah, Waller, me lad. Captain Cuttle... I've been thinking about Miss Dombey and her comfort. Aye. I think we should try to find some woman to attend her while she is here. Someone whom she likes and can trust. Aye, aye. What has become of Susan? Aye. As far as I can make out, my lad, she was sent away a while back. Again, the wishes of heart's delight. Then, Captain, will you ask Miss Dombey where Susan is gone? And we'll communicate with her. Aye, that's a sound notion which I second most hearty. Waller. Yes? Our jewel don't know exactly where Susan's gone. Somewhere's in Essex, she thinks. She said she, she don't know who might know, unless it be Mr. Toots. And who is Mr. Toots? Oh, the young fellers you met the day afore yesterday on the doorstep. Who acted as our go-between? Aye, that's him. A young gentleman of means, and as good-natured as they make him. But a bit at sea on his upper deck, as you no doubt noticed. I did. It was he, it appears, who conducted the young woman to her coach on the day of her departure. He worships the very hem of Miss Dombey's garment, poor fella. Boy, bless me, if that ain't him. Stand back, Walter. He don't know yet as Arch Delight's here. Morning, Mr. Toots. Uh, good morning, Captain Gills. Cuttle. Uh, Captain Gills, I'm in a state bordering on distraction. I haven't dared to shave. I haven't had my clothes brushed. If Burgess and Co. could see me at this moment... Why, brother, you're the wary man we was wanting. This year's Walter, old Saul Gills' nephew. Him as was supposed to have perished at sea. What? How do you do, Mr. Toots? 
You were kind enough the day before yesterday. Good gracious me, what a complication of misery. Uh, the how do you do, uh, Lieutenant Walters? Uh, shipwrecked, were you? I'm afraid you must have got very wet. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, Captain Gills, will you allow me a word alone with you? Oh, I'm alone. Come into the parlor. Ah, now, uh, what is it? Captain Gills, that is the party you spoke of when you said that he and Miss Dombey were made for each other? That, my lad, has always been my opinion. Good gracious! Uh, at this time, of all others, a hated rival. At least he ain't a hated rival. Uh, what should I hate him for? No, if my affection for Miss Dombey has been truly disinterested, let me prove it now. Uh, Lieutenant Walters, uh, how do you do? How are you? I'm very well, I thank you. Very well indeed. How do you do? I hope you didn't take any cold when you were shipwrecked. I hope you will give me the pleasure of your acquaintance. Uh, upon my word and honour, I'm very glad to see you. Thank you heartily, Mr. Toots. I couldn't desire a more genuine or genial welcome. Uh, Captain Gills. Cuddle. Oh, uh, yes. Um, and Lieutenant Walters, are you aware that the most dreadful circumstances have happened at Mr. Dombey's house and that Miss Dombey herself has left her father, who, in my opinion, is a brute, a, a marble monument, a, a bird of prey? Mr. Toots, I am happy to relieve your anxiety. Miss Dombey is here, safe and well. Here? In this house? Yes, Mr. Toots. Sir, Lieutenant Walters, the relief is so excessive and unspeakable that if you were to tell me now that Miss Dombey was married even, I could smile. Uh, yes, Captain Gills, upon my soul and body, I really think, uh, whatever I might do to myself immediately afterwards, that I could smile. I'm so relieved. And Florence herself soon appearing in company with Diogenes... And the question of Susan being discussed, and Florence declaring that nothing could delight her more than to have Susan again with her, Mr. Toots most readily undertook the task of setting off to Essex in search of her. At last, Susan was found and restored to the service of her former mistress. Oh, Miss Floyd. Oh, Miss Floyd, darling. Susan, Susan, dear. But, oh, oh, Miss Floyd, to think that it should come to this. That I should find you here, my own dear dove, with nobody to wait on you, and no home to call your own. But I'll never leave you again, Miss Floyd, never, never. Susan, dear good Susan. But sit down. You're out of breath with running upstairs to me. There. I... I have something to tell you, dear. Yes, Miss Floyd? Susan, I am going to be married. Yes. While Mr. Toots had been absent from London in search of Florence's old attendant, the desire of Captain Cuttle's heart had been accomplished, and Walter and Florence had become engaged. But when poor Mr. Toots learned of this, he was in a pitiably divided state of mind. Miss Dombey, I, I do hope, I I'm sure, that you will be very, very happy. Thank you, Mr. Toots. And uh, now, Miss Dombey, I must bid you... Farewell. I, I, I shall not. I, I cannot. I, I'm in such a condition that, that, that I, I cannot ever come here again. Mr. Toots, you cannot mean that. Oh, you have been such a good friend. I have owed you so much. Excuse me, Miss Dombey. I, I don't think really that I shall be able to. Excuse my tears. They are tears of joy. That, that is, well, very well, Miss Dombey. If you really wish me to come, but, but Miss Dombey... Yes, Mr. Toots? If, if sometimes, uh, when Lieutenant Walters is with you, I should get up and, and rush from the room, uh, don't be alarmed. I shall come back when I've mastered my emotions. But, Mr. Toots... Uh, I, I, I beg your pardon. N nothing could make me happier, I assure you, than, than knowing that you are to be happy. Uh, and wish you joy uh, with, with all my heart. Uh, Lieutenant Walters is a fine young gentleman and worthy of you in every way. Poor Mr. Toots. And poor Susan Nipper, too. For soon Florence had to break to Susan the tidings that their reunion was not to be for long. Susan, dear. Yes, Miss Floyd? After I am married, we must part again. 
apart, Miss Floyd. As soon as we are married, Walter and I are going on a long, long voyage. Oh, but dear Miss Floyd, if that be the case, you'll want me all the more. But Susan, I am going with Walter. We are going to China. China or, or Timbuktu. It's all the same to me. But Walter is poor, dear. And he is going to earn his living. And I must learn now both to help myself and to help him. Oh, it's nothing new for you to help others, I'm sure, Miss Floyd. Oh, but let me speak to Mr. Walter and settle it with him. For to suffer you to go alone across the world, I cannot, I won't. Alone, Susan. Alone and taking Walter with me. I am sure you will not speak to Walter if I ask you not. And pray don't, dear. But, oh, but, Miss Floyd... If you said to him what you have said to me, he, well, he might think that I am afraid of what is before me. And I am not afraid, for I love him. So you won't, will you, Susan? No, Miss Floyd. Not if you ask me not to. But, oh, dear. All the way to China, Miss Floyd. And without me. And so, Mr. Toots and Miss Susan Nipper both had need of comfort in that period before Florence's wedding. This being so, it was natural that they should seek it in each other. Outwardly, Susan was cheerful, active and bustling, but she privately informed Mr. Toots that she was only keeping up for the time being, and that when the wedding was over and her mistress gone, she might be expected to become a very distressful spectacle. Time passes on swift wings till it is the evening before the marriage. All our friends, with the sad exception of old Solomon Gills, are assembled in the parlour at the wooden midshipman, and all are grave and quiet at the prospect of the morrow and the long parting that it will bring. But they were moderately cheerful, too. Florence, with Walter beside her, is finishing a little piece of needlework intended as a parting present for Captain Cuttle. The captain himself is playing cribbage with Mr. Toots, Mr. Toots taking frequent counsel as to his hand of Susan Nipper, and Miss Nipper is giving it with all due secrecy and circumspection. The only member of the party who shows any outward signs of restlessness is Diogenes. For some minutes past, Diogenes has been rising occasionally to his feet and letting out a half-smothered growl and then sinking back onto the floor as if half ashamed of himself for doing it. Quiet, Di, quiet. Pretty boy, stand by. What's amiss with you all of a sudden? You be quiet, brother. Well, Walter, tomorrow's the day. But I do wish at the present juncture, as your Uncle Sol was with us. Uh... So do I, Captain Cuttle. But I do feel, I am sure that my uncle is alive and will someday return. What puzzles me is why he has never written. I suppose he never has. Well, if he wrote, my lad, uh, where be his dispatch? But supposing he entrusted it to someone who lost it? Aye, oh, that's a possibility. Diogenes, do be quiet. Steady, steady, old fellow. Ah, someone at the shop door, is there? I'll go water. Hush, not a word. Maybe it's some person we'd rather not see at the present moment. Ned! What? No! It can't be! Sol Gills! Uncle Sol? It's Sol Gills! It's Gills himself! Sol Gills Ahoy! Wally! Uncle! And the scene that followed, the joy, the explanations... But at last, old Sol was settled among them in an armchair at the fireside. Sol Gills, is it really you? I am to dream in, am I? <laughs> no, Ned, it's me, all right. Dear Uncle Wally, my own dear boy. <sighs> and you and Wally are actually to be married tomorrow, Miss Dombey? Yes, and I am so happy. And now you have returned, and in time for our wedding. One more day, girls, and it'll have been too late. Too late even to see him. But you shouldn't have gone off in that sudden way, girls, old friend. Uh, I had to, Ned. I was so anxious about Wally, I couldn't rest. If I told you, Ned, you, you would have stopped me going. Well, girls, I'd have tried to. And you went off in search of me, Uncle? Yes, dear boy, and I couldn't give up. 
Even when the news reached me that your ship had gone to pieces, I went to every island in the West Indies, till at last, back in Barbados again, I learned that a China clipper had been spoke there and that you were aboard of her. And so, Ned, I took passage in the next ship, and here I am to find it true, thank God. The marriage is over. The young couple have departed. The rest of our friends sit down to their breakfast without them. But nobody can touch a morsel. Mr. Toots whispers to Susan Nipper that he has never been so miserable. And she whispers to him that she hasn't either. And great satisfaction and consolation each derives from telling this to the other. But the captain is resolved at all costs to maintain an outward appearance of cheerfulness. Well, girls... Stand by, shipmate. Keep your head to the wind, old friend. Uh, I will, Ned, I will. My boy has been preserved and thrives. Oh, what right have I to be otherwise than thankful and happy? Ah, girls, I know what. Hmm? There's the last bottle of that old Madeira down below. What say you we have it up and drink to Walter and his wife? No, Ned, not yet. Oh. Uh, we'll drink that bottle, Ned, when he and Florence come home again. Well said. Right. We'll keep it, girls, till they're home again. And what, since Florence had fled from his roof, has that proud man her father been doing? He has made no inquiries as to her whereabouts, simply assuming that if she has not returned to the house, she has taken refuge with his sister, Mrs. Chick. And this he continues to suppose till the morning comes when he receives a letter in Walter's handwriting. Sir, I have left this for my uncle to send you after I have departed from England. I am married to your daughter. She has gone with me on a distant voyage. Why, loving her beyond all earthly things, I have yet united her to the dangers and uncertainties of my life. I will not say to you, you know why, and you are her father. Do not reproach her. She has never reproached you. I do not think or hope you will ever forgive me. There is nothing I expect less. But I can only assure you that as long as we both live, my whole life shall be devoted to her happiness. Walter Guest. And what Mr. Dombey's emotions may be on reading this, no one knows, for not to a soul does he so much as mention the letter. And in truth, his mind at this period is filled with one thing to the exclusion of everything else, the humiliation that he the great Mr. Dombey has suffered in the eyes of the world through the elopement of his wife, Edith, with Carker. Carker, how the world must be sneering at me behind my back. But still I will keep my dignity before the world, pursue my usual routine, attend to my business, just as though nothing has happened. The world shall not say that I, Mr. Dombey, have been humbled. Never. Never. And this resolution he firmly pursues, though his haggard countenance and brooding air he cannot conceal, while plotting to be revenged on Carker. Carker? Carker? Only let me discover their whereabouts, as I will do. Until I have, I shall never rest. Then let Carker look out for himself. Mr. Dombey does not know, and not till long after does he discover, that Edith, in fact, had not eloped with Carker, but had only and quite deliberately deceived her husband, deceived the world, deceived Carker himself into thinking that such was her intention. For Edith, hating both these men, had resolved to drag them both into the dust, even at the cost of her own reputation. And into the dust they are dragged. Carker, finding himself spurned by Edith when they meet in France, and in terrified flight from Mr. Dombey, comes to a fearful end, slipping and falling beneath the wheels of an approaching train to instant death. 
And within a year, the great house of Dombey and Son has closed its doors, ruined, and its owner ruined by the dangerous speculations in which Carker had involved it. It is the end. I have lost everything. I have no pride, no dignity, no self-respect left. And because of my arrogance, my blindness of heart, not a soul in the world to turn to. Yes, now at long last is Mr. Dombey's false and destructive pride finally humbled. His servants are dismissed, his house is to be sold. A broken man, he wanders alone through the great echoing gloomy mansion. In agony and remorse, his thoughts turn to Florence, so constant in her affection, despite his cruel neglect of her. And then the door opens. And is it a dream? There is Florence standing before him. Papa. Florence. Papa. Papa, dearest. Walter and I, we reached London yesterday and have heard all that has happened. Papa, I have a son. His name is Paul. Paul? He was born on the ship. Dear Papa, will you not come with me and see him? And without a word, the tears falling down his furrowed cheeks, he takes her hand and she leads him out to the waiting carriage. Dear Papa, you have no home now. No, Florence, none. But soon Walter and I will have one. He has been given a good position in London by the same firm for whom he went abroad. You will make your home with us. Will you not, Papa? Florence, Florence. You are happy in your marriage. Oh, yes, Papa. So happy. Ah. You... We'll forgive Walter, won't you? Forgive him? I forgive him. My child, if you are happy, that is all that matters. A bottle that has long been excluded from the light of day and is hoary with dust and cobwebs stands on the parlor table of the wooden midshipman. It is the last bottle of the old Madeira. Old Sol has uncorked it and filled the glasses of his companions. Captain Cuttle is there. Mr. Toots, too, with Mrs. Toots. A lady very becomingly dressed and with very bright black eyes. None other, in fact, than the faithful Susan Nipper. Florence and Walter are there as well, and with them is Mr. Dombey. Right, right, Mr. Gills, this is a rare and most delicious wine. Right, it is, Mr. Dombey, sir. Uh, we always promised ourselves, Mr. Dombey, that we would drink this one day or other to Walter safe at home. Uh, though such a homecoming as this we never thought of. Right, Gills, so we did, and no, we didn't. Uh, so, sir, if you don't object to our old whim, let us devote this first glass... To Walter and his wife. Indeed, yes. To Walter and his wife. Florence, my child. Dear Papa. To Lieutenant and Mrs. Walters. Warm, well, my lad. To you and heart's delight. And long may you live and flourish. Thank you, Captain Cuttle. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Dombey. Mm. Walter, Walter. 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 Uh, ah, yes, Mr. Gills. An excellent wife. I don't know that I have ever tasted its equal. The years pass, and other buried wine grows older. Over the door of the wooden midshipman are now painted in bright gold letters these words, Gills and Cuttle. Not a stroke of new business is the midshipman achieving beyond the usual easy trade, but the captain's pride in his new status is inexhaustible. 
He crosses the street 20 times a day to look at the words from the other side of the way. Gills and cuttle. Gills and cuttle. Uh, ship's instrument makers. Well, well. Enemy me, lad. If your mother could have known as you would ever be a man of science, the good old creature would have been took aback indeed. And Saul Gills these days is certainly not breaking his heart at any lack of customers, but looks very contented and jovial indeed. For some of those old investments of his, into which he had put all his savings and which he had once despaired of, have lately been turning out wonderfully well. And it seems that instead of being behind the times as he had supposed, he had been in truth a little before them. But wait! Here is Mr. Toots descending upon the midshipman with violent rapidity, and Mr. Toots's face is very red as he bursts into the little parlour. Captain Gills. Cutter. Oh yes, Mr. Sol Gills. Oh. And I am happy to inform you that Mrs. Toots has had an increase to her family, another daughter. Mr. Toots, I give you joy. So do I, my lads. It does her credit. I knew you'd be glad to hear, so I came down myself. We are positively getting on, you know. That's three we have now. Aye, and all of them girls. All of them girls. And I couldn't be better pleased. The oftener we can repeat that remarkable woman, my wife, the better. Here, here, my lad, dear, here. Thank ye, Captain, uh, for she is a remarkable woman, you know, and of all the remarkable instances she has given of her excellent sense, I think none more remarkable than the perfection with which she has understood my undying devotion to Miss Dombey. Ah. Uh, when I tell her, as I often do, that I shall always consider Miss Dombey the most beautiful, the most amiable, the most angelic of her sex, what does she answer? You are quite right, my dear, she says. I think so, too. And so do I, my lad. And so do I, Mr. Toots. The years pass. Walter, assisted by his uncle's money, but even more by his own industry and competence, is rising high in the firm that employs him. Turn again, Whittington. Gills! Didn't us all of say as Waller will make his fortune? Uh, we always hope so, Ned. We always hope so. And now, Gills, our hopes is beginning to come true. Stand by. Waller will be head of this firm, you see. Uh, and his son, his partner. Aye. And so, Gills, through Mr. Dombey's daughter, another Dombey and son will arise. And arise triumphant. And what of Mr. Dombey himself? His hair is white. His face bears heavy marks of care and suffering. But they are traces of a storm that has passed. His only pride now is in his daughter and her husband and in his grandchildren, both of whom he loves dearly with a love that is entirely unselfish. But of the two, though he is careful to see that the boy never suspects it. It is his granddaughter, little Florence, who holds the first place in his heart and always will do. That was the eighth and last episode of Dombey and Son by Charles Dickens. Mr. Dombey was played by Rafe Truman, Florence by Judith Stott, Walter by Martin Starkey, Captain Cuttle by Frederick Treves, and Mr. Toots by Robert Grant. The narrator was Carlton Hobbs, and the serial was produced for the BBC by Claire Choville.